Um, I'm delighted to, uh, to present uh, to you this, this morning, or this afternoon I should say, by now, um, this presentation on uh, the implications uh, for uh, urban planning and transport infrastructure in, in the specific case of the Netherlands. And uh, what I want to do is focus in very specifically into the metropolitan region of the Randstad, the most uh, economically important uh, region in the country. And, uh, and give you some examples of experience uh, from there. This is a presentation that I um, produced together with a colleague of mine, uh, Avid Myers, um, and uh, there is, um, I should say, more information um, in the accompanying paper um, that was produced um, to, uh, to, uh, um, for the, for the, uh, uh, for the, the, the round table today. Let me um, begin by um, giving you some very brief information about uh, the Netherlands, which is, um, as many people have already recognized, uh, certainly much smaller than uh, China. Um, so we're talking about the equivalent of um, a, a small region within, uh, within uh, China uh, in terms of um, area. It's a country which has almost 17 million inhabitants, um, so that means that it doesn't even feature within the top 50 uh, countries in terms of uh, global population um, from around the world, but it does represent the 17th largest economy in the world. It's a relatively dense country, um, but it's also relatively low, low rise, so it's a low rise, high uh, high density uh, country which has a population density of around 450 persons per square kilometer. It's still experiencing population growth um, unlike some other countries within Europe um, and it's also experiencing um, urbanization, uh, has been experiencing urbanization um, uh, for a very long time now. What's also quite unusual about the, um, the Netherlands is the uh, car ownership rate. Compared to the European average, it's lower, despite the fact that it's one of the uh, uh, wealthier members of the EU. Um, the rate of bicycle ownership is at least twice as high. Um, we don't know for sure what the number is, but it's certainly above one per person. Several Several bikes per, per household are, are the norm. So if we can compare that with, with China, we, we see some, some very big uh, differences. So, um, of course, when it comes to, to drawing lessons, there are some uh, important uh, features to bear in mind when it comes to, uh, to, to comparisons. Now, one of the consequences of uh, relatively modest car ownership and um, high uh, bicycle ownership um, can be seen in this figure here, which relates to the modal split by difference. Um, here we see, um, in terms of total distance traveled, that cycle um, distance is relatively important, although car um, car-based travel is, is naturally very much more important um, and public transport too. When we look, however, at the modal split according to journeys, then we see the, the bicycle is, is very much more important and also uh, um, uh, journeys uh, by foot as well. Now, although we're talking about city clusters and the regional dimension of transport, I make no claim that, that cycling is, is important at that scale, but cycling is very important as a feeder mode of transport in terms of access and egress to, uh, to transport, especially public transport, um, at the regional scale. Now let me just uh, say something briefly about urbanization and urbanization levels. You saw in one of the previous presentations the situation in China and the fact that more than 50% of the population in China now lives in cities. Um, that situation was already the case um, in the 1940s in the Netherlands and we are now approaching a level of 85% of the population being accommodated in, uh, in urban areas, which is pretty similar to the situation in the United uh, States. 
just to illustrate that in terms of uh, map uh, material, you see here a situation of urban areas in the 1950s, 60 years ago. You see the, the main areas of population illustrated here in the, uh, the, the, the red parts of, of the map. 60 years on, you see a very different um, situation. Not only in terms of the amount of land which has been urbanized, but also, uh, quite importantly, two new areas which are, are very uh, unusual, at least for European, uh, um, uh, European uh, uh, standards, and that is the creation of, uh, of new areas of land within the, uh, the territory. Um, the the Flavopolder, uh, which is the larger area which was created by reclaiming land from the sea, um, which has been used for um, two new towns since the um, 1950s, and the second area, the smaller area on the coast, which accommodates the new port area of Rotterdam, dub almost doubling its, uh, its surface area um, of a port which is already um, uh, one of the, the largest in the world. I want to talk specifically about the situation in the Randstad, and uh, as I say, the country is um, characterized by high density, low rise development. Um, that's also the case in, in the Randstad. The area itself is um, to the west of the, the country. It contains um, much of the country's population. What's interesting is that it has no one dominant core city, that there are several cities here uh, which are equally important, but um, as, you, as I'll present later, they're important for different functional reasons. Um, the Randstad doesn't constitute a, a government um, entity, a government um, uh, boundary, um, and as such, there is no official um, delineation of the Randstad. But according to most definitions of the, uh, the Randstad area, it's one of Europe's most populous areas um, alongside uh, more monocentric regions like, uh, like London, uh, like Paris um, and Milan, and other polycentric regions like the Rhein-Ruhr area, for example. So the Randstad contains the four largest cities in the country. They're not, by Chinese standards, very big. Um, even the, the, the largest cities in the Netherlands are less than one million in terms of population. But as a whole, the whole urban region contains more than seven million inhabitants, which is more than 40% of the, uh, the country's population, concentrated into about a quarter of the, uh, the land area. It also contains a number of uh, smaller cities uh, within the region, and as I said earlier, it has a very polycentric or polynuclear um, structure, which I'll talk about in more detail later on in my presentation. And the four main cities are very much um, specialized and have complementary functions. Um, Amsterdam is um, a center for culture and, and finan the financial sector. Rotterdam is very important uh, for, for shipping and, and trade uh, sectors. The Hague, meanwhile, is the center of government. It's also the center to a number of important international organizations, including the International uh, Court for Justice. And Utrecht, uh, to the east of the Randstad, is um, specialized in uh, a number of health and uh, service sector industries. There's a lot of interrelation between these different cities as well, as I'll talk about later. But let me first talk about the network nature of the infrastructure um, connecting the, the, the cities within the Randstad. And you can see this um, through a number of different illustrations. And here I just want to show you the evolution over time of the rail network. And you can also see the evolution in terms of the um, development of urban structure if you also look at the road network. But let me just illustrate this briefly by showing how the urban structure developed in relation to uh, the, the rail network um, starting from the mid-1850s 
going through to uh, almost the, the present day. And we see that a lot of development is very much coincident with the development of infrastructure. Which means that today we have a road and rail network um, which is um, uh, very uh, uh, comprehensive. It's also one which is um, extremely interlinked. Um, so there's a whole uh, set of, of, of patterns and relationships uh, and, and connections that can be made between uh, the cities, uh, both larger and smaller, within the area of, of the Randstad and the country as a whole. It's a very a high frequency network um, and that counts uh, both for, um, for road and, and, and rail. It's one of the busiest networks within the EU. And uh, if we look at, at rail, more than a million passengers per day are carried um, within the, the, the country. One could argue that the polycentric structure of uh, this network could also provide some potential benefits in terms of uh, less vulnerability to uh, uh, disruptions to the system, which is perhaps not an, import an unimportant uh, issue to, to bear in mind uh, when thinking about urban structure. If we look at commuting patterns within the um, area of the Randstad, then we see quite a complex picture. This is the uh, situation um, as a whole, which uh, indicates the level of commuting, the interrelation, if you like, uh, an indication of the interrelation between the cities within the Randstad, showing quite a complexity of uh, uh, interrelationships. And the fact that there could be, on the basis of uh, these global patterns, um, some kind of... Uh, uh, distinction between the northern and the southern part of the, uh, the, the region. But this is just one illustration of um, the, the interrelation between the cities. If we look more specifically um, at different types of flows, then what emerges are different pictures of the, uh, the interrelationships and the interactions between cities. Here's a an illustration of the direction of flow showing the extent to which flows are symmetrical or non-symmetrical, in other words, the extent to which certain areas are uh, important for um, uh, providing work um, and uh, other areas which are more important for, um, for residential, for example. If we also look at um, different types of work, then we see some important uh, distinctions. Here, if we look at the interrelation between cities, um, in terms of low-skilled um, jobs and, and the uh, movement of, of people for, for low-skilled work, then we see a picture which doesn't illustrate a huge amount of complexity or interaction, um, perhaps to some degree in the southern part of, uh, of, of the region. But if we look at higher skilled jobs, then that situation changes um, quite a lot. If we look at business-related travel, then we also see a, 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 a large amount of interaction between the, the cities and the Randstad. And if we look at shopping, retail activities, then we see another set of, of patterns. So the situation is very much contingent on the, the indicators that we use and the, uh, the types of flows that we choose to, to look at. But nevertheless, I think what we can argue as a whole is that there are some very strong interactions between uh, these cities for a variety of, of reasons. So urban networks, um, feature as part of the policy discourse in the Netherlands and have um, featured for quite a, a long time uh, within, within the country and uh, decisions are often made in terms of infrastructure and transport policy based on the premise that there is this interaction between uh, uh, cities within the region. Now ideas about clusters are not new um, I don't have time to, to explain this in uh, a lot of detail, except to say that whether city clusters perform better economically, environmentally or socially um, than a single city of the same size, 
than the sum of all the uh, the, the uh, individual city clusters has not been established conclusively. This is something which is still very much uh, being debated. Um, on the one hand, there are agglomeration benefits of city clusters. On the other hand, there can be um, what, what are called agglomeration shadows being cast um, as a result of uh, these uh, these clusters compared to, uh, to, to, to single cities. Now, I wanted very briefly to talk about um, a number of phases in which development has taken place to accommodate um, new, new uh, uh, housing, new industry within the Netherlands. I have to do this very quickly given the, the time constraints, but I want to really pick out four main phases in terms of the development of the, uh, the urban fabric within the Randstad. Starting in the 1950s, which were, can be characterized um, by a period of suburbanization, um, but a protection of what is often called the green heart, the, 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 the space in the middle, which is not entirely green, but is um, protected for, for, for um, from development for, for many reasons, including recreation and uh, uh, biodiversity. And this period of suburbanization was driven primarily by concerns about overcrowding, air quality, health uh, um, issues, but it resulted in quite extensive um, areas being urbanized. Um, at, the, at the same time, there were some cuts in rail in infrastructure, and that led um, to increasing levels of, of motorization um, within the area. The second phase um, can be characterized by a period of building new towns, uh, which started in the 1960s and continued um, up until the late 1980s. Um, so this was a move away from suburbanization and, and to separate cities um, within the, the urban region. Um, one of the consequences of this um, period of, of urbanization was the fact that um, a lot of the, the areas um, that were developed tended to be quite um, monofunctional. They tended to function as dormitory uh, towns for larger cities in the, uh, in the immediate vicinity. And as a consequence, that increased the amount of travel taking place um, between the uh, new towns and their adjacent cities. But that's not to say that there weren't some successes within these new towns. Uh, Zutomir, for example, which was primarily built as an urban extension to The Hague, was um, built around a, a rail backbone which provided um, both local and, and regional uh, connections to, uh, uh, m to, to, to much of the, the development. Um, and Houghton, which was an urban extension to Utrecht, um, also was built around a, a rail system and also had a very comprehensive set of um, cycle um, facilities built into, uh, into the system. The third period of urban growth um, that I want to mention is a, um, a period which um, took place in the 1990s and the early 2010s, characterized by urban extensions, um, compactness of development. Um, some of the issues related to this, um, which were less positive for a transport perspective, was that public transport services were often uh, developed quite late, and as a consequence, car-based um, uh, patterns of, um, of mobility had already become established and are, of course are very different, difficult to, uh, to reverse um, once they've been established. And that many of these developments were in close proximity to, um, uh, to, to motorways which also increased car reliance. The current um, phase of urban growth is taking place at a much smaller scale. Um, it's primarily um, related to urban infill. It's smaller scale, but it's certainly not at the individual level, and it's strongly related to development around uh, transport and infrastructure. Let me talk very briefly. Um, I know that my time is, is uh, almost 
uh, over, but I just have a few issues in relation to current transport policy, which I think are very important for relating this back to urban structure. So we're talking about a dense uh, road, rail, and, and waterway network, um, <coughs> which are important for the transport sector nationally and, and, and locally. The, um, the key areas of activity within transport policy are linking the urban network to, um, uh, to, to make sure that uh, economic activity is, uh, is promoted across the whole region. It's about maximizing the use of capacity, not necessarily about uh, increasing capacity, but of course that's also taking place. And it's about promoting uh, greater use of integrated modes of, of transport and of course reducing environmental impacts, social impacts. Um, uh, which are uh, associated with uh, with infrastructure. Um, I could have talked to you about the um, high-speed rail network, which is one of the examples of uh, of, of linking the urban network. But I, I'll have to uh, to limit that to uh, j just showing you this this figure uh, at the moment, uh, a, a relatively new uh, new uh, line, 120 kilometres, which um, connects different points within the. Uh, Randstad, including the, the, the main airport in Schiphol, um, including a seven kilometre uh, tunnel, um, which is part of that, uh, that network, as a concession to um, reducing the amount of landscape that was um, affected by, uh, by the high speed uh, network. When we talk about maximizing capacity, um, there's been a lot of activity recently in terms of maximizing the use of existing infrastructure, and this is just one example where additional lanes um, are being used, and this is the, uh, the em emergency uh, lane on the side of one of the, the motorways in the Netherlands, which is now um, used for, um, uh, for uh, all um, vehicles at certain points um, during the, the day. Another way of uh, maximizing capacity um, that has been pursued, although more recently has um, been um, abandoned, and that's the um, road pricing scheme, which was um, discussed quite a lot in the 2000s, um, but in 2010, due to, uh, to uh, political changes, um, was, uh, was, was abandoned, but it was seen as a possible way of reducing uh, local traffic on national infrastructure, and this is a key issue um, that I think is important to return to in the uh, discussion. Another aspect which is very much important is integrated ticketing and in integrated information within the network. And this is something where I think the Netherlands is extremely uh, uh, strong and interesting to, to look at, where one card can be used across the whole network, uh, not just the rail network, but also the whole public transport network. Um, and this is complemented by integrated travel information for the whole country, um, including uh, real-time information. Um, so it's even possible to, to find travel information if there's disruption to certain parts of the, uh, the public transport system. Let me say something about the conclusions and lessons from this very, very brief tour of the situation in the Netherlands, and that is that I think what we see is that transportation and infrastructure development in city clusters um, is recognized as being very uh, uh, important and closely tied. That disentangling, disentangling local and metropolitan traffic, both in terms of road and rail, um, could have some benefits to the performance of these city clusters. And that maximizing existing capacity, rather than adding capacity in itself, is crucial to the equation uh, when we talk about um, the performance of city clusters. Thank you very much for your attention.